three, two. Good afternoon. As chair, I now call to order the March 20, 2023 meeting of the Policy Review Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. In accordance with Board Policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's Policy Review Committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through Microsoft Teams Live on the BCPS website. To conduct this meeting by virtual means, all vote, voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will sit, say their names before making and seconding a motion as a, applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on, agen, on, an agen, excuse me, on an agenda item. Additionally, as a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Walsh, Ms. Pitts, or Ms. Howie if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Pitts, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Yes, Dr. Hager. Present. Thank you, Ms. Harvey. Present. Thank you, Ms. Hassan. Dr. Savoy. Present. Thank you. Ms. Pumphrey. Present. Thank you. With four present, we have a quorum. Thank you, Ms. Pitts. Please call the roll to determine which staff members are present in this meeting. Sure. Dr. Yarbrough. Ms. Charlie Green. Mr. Pete Dixit. Present. Thank you. Mr. Homer McCall. Present. Thank you. Ms. Bashira James. Present. Thank you. Ms. Joelle Bilski. Present. Thank you. Mr. Merrill Plate. Present. Thank you. Ms. Howie. Here. Thank you. And Ms. Wash. Here. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pitts. Um, the first item on our agenda is B1 policy 2310. And for that, I call on Mr. McCall. Good afternoon. The policy analysis for 2310, the statement of issues and questions addressed in accordance with the Board of Education Policy and Students Rule 8130. Policy 2310 is scheduled for review in, sc in school year 22-23. Policy 2310 supports the board's mission to maintain an organizational structure focused on performance, accountability, and meeting the school system's goal of organizational effectiveness. Staff is recommending no substantive changes and is presenting policy 2310 to the committee for re-adoption. The policy presented for the committee's consideration contains the following revision, just inserting an Oxford comma, where indicated to conform with the policy review committee's editing conventions. Policy statement to achieve the stated mission and goals of the school system, the Board of Education of Baltimore County, the board must maintain an organizational structure focused on performance, accountability, and meeting the school system's goal of organizational effectiveness. Standards annually, the superintendent shall prepare an organizational chart and submit it to the board for approval. Organizational chart shall include the positions that report directly to the superintendent and positions at the executive director level and above. B, all organizational changes involving positions that report directly to the superintendent or positions at the executive director level and above shall be submitted to the board for its approval. The implementation, the board directs the superintendent to implement this policy. Thank you, Mr. McCall. Is there any discussion on the recommended changes to policy 
If there are no corrections, policy 2310 is moved forward for first reader as presented. Thank you, Mr. McCall. For, Thank you. For the next agenda item B2, we have policy 4203. And for that, I call on Mr. I'm sorry, Ms. James. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. So in accordance with the Board of Education policy and superintendent's rule 8130 policy, um, this policy is scheduled for review for the year 22-23. The changes made to this policy um, reflect a change with respect to assault leave. The proposed change includes um, the definition of assault leave and the bounds to include both BCPS property and school-sponsored events. The proposed changes also have been amended to conform with the Policy Review Committee's editing conventions. Okay, is the there board, any, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. No, you could proceed. I'm sorry. I thought you were. Um, I, I, I was and I just wanted to um, to add in that the just to kind of reiterate that the board's policy um, provides for leaves resulting not only from an assault, but also an injury that is sustained during the prevention of violence or the intervention um, within a fight. The other record. I'm sorry. No the problem. other recommended the other recommended changes again um, relate to the clarification of duty days, the identification of the office for under which this policy is administered, and the clarification um, of religious holidays, as outlined in the definition with MS with MSDE. OK, um, does anybody have any questions or is there any discussion on the recommended changes to policy 4203? Just a second. OK, if there are no corrections and no objection, policy 4203 is moved forward for first reader as presented. Next on the agenda is item B3, policy 4402, absences and leaves. And again, uh, we call on Ms. James for this. Thank you. OK, so once again, in accordance with the Board of Education policy and superintendent's rule 8130, policy 4402 is scheduled for the review in the school year 2022-23. There are no substantive changes to this policy at this time. The policy includes the insertion of this section implementing rule. And there were hyperlinks placed. In the superintendent's rule docs to respond to a public works recommendation. Is there any discussion or questions on the recommended changes for policy 4402? If there are no corrections and no objections, policy 4402 is moved forward for first reader as presented. Thank you, Ms. Uh, James. Madam, Madam Chair, members of the yes. committee, may Ms. James be excused. I believe that was her last policy today. Yes, thank you, Ms. James. Thank you. Thank you. And the next item on our agenda is item B4, policy 6301, school, the school calendar. And for that, we call on Ms. Bielski. Good afternoon. Thank you. 
In accordance with Board of Education Policy and Superintendent's Rule 8130, Policy 6301 outlines the board's responsibility to develop and adopt an annual school calendar that is consistent with applicable law, includes federal and state holidays, legally required to be observed by Maryland Public Schools, and considers feedback from the community and staff. The um, changes proposed are as follows. The first would be the definition of religious holiday was updated to include the language that is provided by MSDE in its state testing and training calendar. The second change proposed was in paragraph B, um, section three standards. Early dismissals have been included because they must also be anticipated. The third, we inserted a new section implementing rule and placed a hyperlink with, to the superintendent's rules in the board docs to respond to the public works recommendation 8-30. We also inserted the, the Oxford comma where indicated in conformity with the policy review committee's editing conventions. Fifth, we modified the title of COMAR 13.03.02.12a from length of school year to general provisions to reflect the proper legal name of the regulation. And last, in paragraph 1A, policy statement was replaced by law with legally for clarity. Okay, thank you. And I believe Ms. Hager has a question. Um, yes, thank you. I just wanted clarification. I, I, I know you said uh, that we're required to specify the holidays that are um, required in state law, um, but we, as a school board in 2021 specified additional holidays to be included in the calendar. Um, I just wanted to uh, bring up the discussion of whether that those should be included in this policy. It's my my hope that they will be included, but I wanted to understand why they weren't in the draft. Um, I, I see no issue with adding those and being more specific to BCPS Board of Ed, um, those as of November 23rd, 2021 and outlining them. Okay, great. Um, is it okay if I make a motion then to add them? Chair? Humphrey? Yes. Okay, thank you. I think I, sorry, um, I, think I, I I'm, I'm looking, pulling up your motion. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Okay, I, I can put it in the chat as well. Um, I would just move to add under um, 2B line 24 where it specifies school holidays. Um, I would add uh, at the end of that statement where it already says a holiday that is recognized by state law as a public school holiday. Um, I would recommend adding or recognized by the BCPS BOE as a school holiday as of November 23rd, 2021. And then in parentheses, holidays include Diwali, Lunar New Year, El, Eid al Fitr, Juneteenth, and Eid al Adha. So saying, specifying each of the holidays that were added by the school board. And I'll second that motion. This is Ms. Hassan. Thank you. So the motion is to amend. Back to the policy number, sorry. Oh, amend policy 6301 under 2B line 24 to add after the description of school holiday or recognized by BCPS BOE as a school holiday as of, as of November 23rd, 2021. Holidays include Diwali, Lunar New Year, Ed al Fitr, Juneteenth, and Ed al Adha. Adha, which I'm sure I mispronounced. I apologize for that. Um, any discussion on that amendment? Um, if you don't mind, if I could just briefly speak to it, I, I'm, yes. I'm sure I'm sure you, you all know what I'm what I'm about to say, but just that our, our county is more diverse than the state as a whole. And so I think it is really, um, you know, for all the reasons we discussed back in uh, in 2021, um, you know, specifying the the holidays that are relevant to our our community of BCPS, and ensuring that our calendar is inclusive for all students, I know has always been a priority of ours. So I just it would be great to put it in policy. Any other questions or comments before we vote on the motion to amend? Just look at the chat to make sure I didn't miss anyone. Okay. All in favor of amending policy 6301 under line under 2B line 24 
after school holiday to add or recognize by the BCPS BOE as a school holiday as of November 23rd, 2021. Holidays include Diwali, Lunar New Year, Ed al, al Juneteenth, and Ed al Ada. Please answer yes when your name is called. All opposed, please answer no. And Ms. Pitts, can you please call the roll for the vote? Yes, ma'am. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Okay, Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. All right, we have four in favor. Okay, the affirmative has it, has it and the motion to amend is adopted. We will now vote on whether policy 6301 will be moved forward as amended. So the question is on policy 6301 as, a, as amended. Ms. Pitts, can you please call the roll? Yes, Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Four in favor. So policy um, as amended, policy 6301 is moved forward for first reader. Thank you, Ms. Bielski. Thank you. Uh, next on our agenda is item B5, which is policy 70, 7260. Um, and for that, I call on Dr. Yarborough, Mr. Dixit, and Mr. Plate. Uh, my apologies, Ms. Pumphrey. May Ms. Bielski be excused. Uh, her policy is concluded. Yes, thank you, Ms. Bielski. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Pete Dixit. I'm here representing uh, Dr. Yarborough, and Mr. Plate has joined here with me. In accordance with the Board of Education Policy and Superintendent's Rule 8130, Policy 7260 is scheduled for review in school year 2022-2023. Policy 7260 establishes the board's belief that school marquee signs encourage community participation by enhancing school identity, school spirit, and school communication with the community. Staff is recommending that the policy be revised to update the titles of related policies, two, include a compliance statement, three, comply with the policy review committee's editing conventions. There is no fiscal impact that, that is anticipated by the revision of this policy. And that concludes my presentation of the request. Thank you, Mr. Dix Dixit. Um, is there any discussion or questions on policy 7260? I have Dr. a quick Hager. question. Yeah, yes. thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, I, I, when I read it, I just wanted to clarify, um, are you are you saying that when a school puts words on their marquee that that's going to be regulated by the county? Or is it just the overall aesthetic of the marquee is what's going to be standardized? That's a good question. Thank you for asking. Uh, so the purpose of this policy is to make sure that there is consistency, uniformity, and that all marquee sign, uh, they are in compliance with local and state codes. So not the letters that people are individually putting on, but just the overall marquee? That's correct. The, just letters, the yeah. letters are still, uh, uh, we work together with the principal to make sure that the letters are correct and is consistent with this, what the school's needs are. So if someone puts, puts a cute little saying to their community up, then that's that's what I'm saying. It, it, how, how what degree is this is this policy getting into the the marquee? Is it is it regulating those types of things, or is it just the building structure of the marquee? It's mainly structure of the policy. 
uh, structure of the marquee sign. OK, that, that's what I was trying to ask. Thank you. I have a question. Will any current existing signs that you know of need to be changed based on a, a change in this policy? No, no, there will be no changes in any of the existing signs. Any other questions? There are no corrections and no objection. Policy 7260 is moved forward for first reader as presented. Next, we have item B6, which is policy 7520, naming or renaming a school and dedication. And for that, we call on Mr. Dixit again. Thank you again. And, and the policy 7520, as you indicated, is for naming of the building and dedication in accordance with the Board of Education policy and superintendent's rule 8130. Policy and rule 7520 are scheduled for review in school year 2022-2023. Uh, this policy 7520 establishes standards and criteria for the process of naming or renaming a school. There are no substantive changes being recommended and staff is presenting policy 7520 to the committee for re-adoption. Some of the changes uh, that have been made are as follows. Inserted an Oxford comma, we are indicated to conform with policy review committee's ed editing conventions. Number two, inserted new section implementing rule and placed a hyperlink to the superintendent's rule in board docs to respond to the public works recommendation 830. In paragraph 3B standards, the words review and were inserted to clarify the board's process. Updated the title of related policy 7530 to reflect the correct name. There is no fiscal impact uh, that is anticipated by readopting the policy. And that concludes my request. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. Are there any questions or discussion regarding changes to policy 7520? There are no corrections and no objection. Policy 7520 is moved forward for first reader as presented. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. Thank you. May, may Mr. Dixit and Mr. Plate be excused, members of the committee? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Next item on our agenda is item B7, policy 0500. And for that, I call on Ms. Howie. Thank you, members of the committee. Good afternoon. Uh, you have before you a new policy. Uh, as uh, your chair has stated, it is, it's been numbered policy 0500. Last year, uh, Ms. Hen asked that a policy be drafted along the same lines as the Montgom Montgomery County Public Schools policy concerning workplace bullying and employee bullying. Uh, as a result of her request, uh, the members of the committee last year placed this on the agenda for the 22-23 school year. What you have before you is what has been drafted for your consideration. Uh, we did look at, or uh, staff in the Office of Law did look at the Montgomery County policy, but we also looked at other policies in the state. When we spoke to our colleagues uh, in the school system, uh, and this is included in the analysis, it was staff's response that uh, current policy addresses workplace bullying issues, but again, this was a directive of this committee, and for that reason, you have the draft policy. So basically what the policy does is define what workplace bullying is, is indicate that workplace bullying is unacceptable 
Uh, and it also indicates uh, what workplace bullying is not. So it is not giving direction uh, from a supervisor to an employee to complete um, a task. Uh, it is not and does not necessarily have to be based on um, a discriminatory reason or a protected class. Uh, and uh, I'm aware that there has been there's been at least one email that has been sent to the BOE account uh, from a member of the public, I believe, indicating support for the policy. Uh, we have not received anything directly um, from other members of the public, but this is something that at least caught the attention of one of the members of the public. And with that, I'm available to answer questions. Okay, does anyone have any questions? Ms. Harvey? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So, what if this if this policy or the contents of the policy are covered in other uh, policies that we already have in place? Can you just review for me what the auspices was for singling out this particular policy? Was it uh, a number of complaints? Was it that we felt that the policies that already talk about workplace harassment or bullying were not clear or specific to bullying. Can you give me some background on that, please? I do not have any other background other than the directive that was provided to staff uh, last year. First, it was a, a request from Ms. Hen, a discussion in PRC. I believe Dr. Hager uh, recall some of those discussions, and then it was placed on your uh, your calendar for this year. But I don't recall that there was a specific incident or set of incidents that was discussed when the policy was requested. Is is it your assessment that what we have in current policy sufficiently covers what has been um, put into this policy? or does this policy fill in gaps that weren't in our previous policies? So uh, the, the concept of bullying is, uh, is not related to harassment, for example, or discrimination. So to that extent, it is not covered by law. It is not illegal to bully another employee unless you're doing it for a reason that is based in discrimination. It may be um, uh, poor practice, it may be poor management, uh, it may be a number of other things, but it may not be defined as bullying. So this is creating a new category. Uh, and again, this was the directive that was given to the, that the committee gave to staff. So, it was expressed, as I recall, uh, without expressing a particular set of facts, that this was not something that was currently in board policy and therefore should be in board policy. But beyond that, uh, I confess, Ms. Harvey, I do not recall a specific set of facts that, um, that led to this request. Dr. Hager, do you have a comment, question? Um, yes, I I am really glad to see this. I, I believe from my memory, Ms. Howie, um, part of this came up because we were reviewing policy 5580, which is the student bullying policy, and it does not cover staff. And so that was a, a discussion that happened in the PRC about um, last May about uh, you know whether or not staff are, are covered by that policy. And so um, I think that was what Again, based on my memory, led to the directive to create this for staff. And given that so many other districts, not just Montgomery County, have a similar policy, I, I think it's a, a great addition. Um, my only question is, I, I recall, and I just look back to back at 5580 as well, a, a deep discussion on kind of what happens when bullying occurs. And I know that in the policy, it talks about kind of the procedures for how how then it's handled and. I know this is a new policy, so maybe um, I'm jumping the gun, but um, but uh, should we, 
should we have that in this policy? Do you think since it's a new policy, we should just see what uh, the superintendent's rule states and then kind of go from there? Or kind of what what advice would you have on um, on that aspect of the policy? So the policy does indicate that the superintendent is required to implement. And given that this is a new requirement and individuals are going to have to be trained and that is in the analysis, an individual employee may not know uh, what bullying is or what it looks like. So uh, in order to make sure it's implemented with fidelity and implemented so that it's um, it and understood both by the person who could be um, subject to bullying behavior as well as uh, managers or co-workers who could be bullying. Uh, I don't think at this point, given that we are treading new ground, um, that uh, it should be within the board's purview to specifically or explicitly indicate how it should be implemented. I believe that's administration. I think that makes total sense. I just wanted to, to ask a question. I appreciate your answer very much. So thank you. Truly. Any further questions for discussion? OK, if there are no corrections and no objections, policy 0500 is moved forward for first reader. As presented. Thank you, board members. Thank you, Ms. Howie. OK, next on our agenda is item C for committee discussion, policy 8315, participation by the public. Many members, as you will recall, at our last meeting, we asked staff to provide more information on this topic. Ms. Howie, could you please explain what has been provided to the committee on this topic? Excuse me, I'm sorry oh, I'm to sorry. interrupt. Madam sure. Chair, sure. Uh, before we begin the conversation in the mm -hmm. spirit of transparency, I wanted to inform the committee that although my understanding is that a, a board member, this this discussion was initiated by a board member that I am a member of the Randallstown NAACP stakeholder group and uh, wanted to know the committee's uh, pleasure in my participation in this uh, discussion. Dr. Hager, you have a comment? Um, I would just say I, I appreciate the disclosure that uh, you just provided. Um, I think that that says a lot about your character and I, I have no problem with you participating in this discussion personally, um, I, given that I, I feel that you can be an impartial um, person, but um, I appreciate your disclosure. Thank you, Dr. Hager. I was also at the same time that you spoke, Ms. Harvey, thinking about the fact that I know I am, but many of us are probably members of PTAs and Baltimore County PTA Council is also part of this, which, which I think probably brings a number of us into the same position as you are. Um, although we're local PTA members, that makes you automatically a, a member of Baltimore County Council PTA as, PTA as well. So thank you for bringing that to my attention. Thank you. I think Dr. Hager may have another comment. Dr. Hager, do you have another comment? No, I just was going to say, I was sorry to type that that's true. I hadn't thought of that with your, your PTA comment, so that's all. Yeah, that was my pause. I was thinking, well, you know what? <laughs> that makes sense. Thank you, Ms. Harvey. OK. So, uh, Ms. Howie, I already asked, could you please explain uh, what has been provided to the committee on this topic? Surely, uh, members of the committee, at your last uh, meeting, you asked that staff provide to you uh, some data on when individuals and how often certain individual and individuals and groups uh, address the board. So, uh, Ms. Gover compiled that data that has been uploaded. Uh, as well, what you have uh, last meeting, I provided to you what other uh, Maryland school systems do with respect to stakeholders. I provided to you uh, a, a summary of a survey that I conducted 
uh, through the National School Boards Association, council school attorneys um, about what other um, school systems and school districts uh, in other states do. Uh, and as you'll see, it's it's varied, but there is uh, a dearth of definitions of stakeholder uh, as there was with our Maryland LEAs. So simply for discussion today, simply as a jumping off point, I've provided two options to the committee. Uh, the first option, and again, my apologies uh, for uploading the incorrect document. The first option, which I referenced briefly uh, during one of our discussions, uh, is to um, excise stakeholder groups entirely. So you would take out the definition that is currently in subsection two, uh, and as well take out subsection four. What is the current subsection four? Option two, uh, is a less um, radical, perhaps, depending on your, your point of view, uh, possibility. And in that, uh, subsection F, which is other advisory committees and associations identified by the board, that is what would come out of your definition of stakeholder groups. So there would no longer be the, uh, the addition um, and then uh, no longer um, would people kind of wonder uh, whether or not there are additional um, groups that could be added. Uh, this does not, as you're aware, um, or this does not, I do not think, take away all of the issues regarding whether or not stakeholder groups, um, excuse me, are a wise idea. Um, in the way they're defined currently in that they're not defined. And that is part of the reason for these two options so that the committee could discuss what best fits the, the board's needs at this time uh, with this policy. So with that, I will allow Ms. Humphrey to um, moderate this discussion, which I'm sure will be fun. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Howie. So the floor is now open to members of the committee so that we may discuss how to revise policy 8315. Um, I think you sort of answered this, Ms. Howie. I, my, one of my questions, and I've heard all other people ask, is how does, how does this affect other ways that stakeholders' opinions are taken into account? A good example would be, um, well, it wouldn't take effect now, but would be our superintendent search or anytime stakeholders are identified. So if we remove this completely for this from this policy, um, when stakeholder input is needed for other issues in addition to public comment, how will it change that procedure? So this policy only speaks to how certain groups are recognized at your board meetings. Does it speak to input, <coughs> excuse me, that uh, certain groups, certain communities can provide in other ways. This is only participation at your school board meetings. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments? Um, Dr. Hager? Um, as a follow-up on that, and then I have another question. Um, when I interviewed for the appointed position on the board, there were multiple stakeholders, many of whom are the stakeholder groups that speak at our meetings, who sat on the appointment committee. Um, so just following up, um, this list is not related to, to that as either the appointment committee seatings or anything like that? No, ma'am. The, um, the committee uh, that uh, interviewed you, the membership is set by state statute. Okay. All right. Um, and then my, my, kind of my personal discussion point, and I, I can share my, my own uh, kind of bias in this as well, well is that um, I, I do think we need a mechanism for adding stakeholder groups unless we limit it dramatically or, or remove them totally, which I, I don't know that I'm, I'm necessarily for, but um, I, as I've mentioned in the past, sit on the, the local school health council, which is a required group that's not listed in the stakeholder groups as of 2018, 2019, even though we have Baltimore County uh, staff member representation leadership um, as designated 
reflected in state law. We have school, local health department representation. You know, in many ways, we reflect um, a lot of the other stakeholder groups, but I guess it, for some reason it wasn't listed in 1819. Um, and so without a mechanism for adding groups that may have been overlooked or a new group that may form, including uh, Ms. Sassan's um, uh, uh, not motion, but um, <laughs> statement the other day that, that added the mental health focus group. I mean, having having a mechanism to add groups, I think is important if we are going to include stakeholder groups in this. And so that's just my own perspective. Thank you, Ms. Harvey. Do you have a comment or question? I do. Thank you, Madam Chair. If we have uh, for for option two, where we're keeping certain stakeholders and eliminating F under uh, option two, I'm trying to do a side by side kind of with the sign in sheet versus which to determine which groups would be eliminated if we eliminated F only. Could you identify those groups for me? Sure, that would be the Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee, um, the Baltimore County Alliance of Black School Educators, the Career and Technology Educational Advisory Council, the Citizens Advisory Committee for Gifted and Talented Education, uh, the NAACP, the Randallstown chapter, as well as the Baltimore County chapter. Uh, thank you for that. And then I, I think uh, we would need to consider how these voices that we use throughout other parts of our process, interviews, stakeholder input, for instance, as the chair mentioned, our superintendent search, how we uh, continue to hear these voices that we have previously identified as um, voices that we particularly need to hear um, in our public comment. And again, I think that is where some of your, uh, for lack of a better term, wrestling with this language is going to bear fruit. Um, I mean, Dr. Hager indicated a way to, to add stakeholder groups or a, perhaps some sort of evaluative mechanism um, but uh, one thing I would strongly recommend that if the uh, if it's the committee's desire um, to continue to have stakeholder groups, that there be some sort of definition so that it so that in adding you can have um, at least a clear focus as to uh, how you would add, because if. Um, uh, an individual appears and says, I represent X number of families. Do you want signatures? Do you want them to um, to indicate that they don't rec they don't um, uh, represent a small sliver of the community? Um, do you want, uh, as you said, you want voices heard? Um, and how, which voices are those? Are you limiting some voices by asking for others? Uh, I don't believe that I uh, put this full comment in the, uh, the spreadsheet about out of state research, but one of my colleagues um, uh, asked whether or not the board was, um, was limiting speech by simply having stakeholders. I have not done the research um, in that manner, uh, but I thought that was an interesting way of looking at it, that the minute you designate someone as stakeholders, as a stakeholder to speak, then you've automatically designated someone else as not a stakeholder. So that's another consideration. And again, I think that it's um, it's what the committee's pleasure is and what is it that you want to see at your board meetings? Who do you want to to be heard? And if groups don't come, is there a way, is there a mechanism you want to include for no longer having those groups recognized? Do you want to have reviews, um, you know, every two years or so? I mean, what is that exactly? Is it that, you know signatures? You can show that you represent this 
um, this number of the county um, or of the, the the population or of an employee group or of some sort of other interest group. So I, I think that's what um, where some of the um, tension is perhaps. Ms. Harvey, did you have another comment? Yes, thank you. Is there a way as we consider how we're going to uh, manage these options and maintain um, as broad a spectrum of voices that we can in our public comment section, is there a way to, not to complicate things, but to add another category of um, maybe uh, community groups? So those advocacy groups that may not be listed as stakeholders, but um, if we can have slots specifically dedicated to uh, community organizations that, that want to come and be identified as a group, as an organization uh, representing a point of view, uh, in addition to the general public comment and the stakeholder comment. That's just uh, a, another way of thinking about how we broaden the number of voices. So if I remember correctly, I think it was Colbert County. It was one of the, the southern counties um, and perhaps it was Garrett as well, that if you come forward and indicate that you are representing a community um, or a group, you get five minutes as opposed to three minutes, but there's no preference in uh, or no guarantee that you'll be able to speak. Simply that if you identify as um, the representative of a group, you get additional minutes. And again, I think it was one of the, the Southern Maryland counties, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Ms. Wash, if you wouldn't mind checking the, the spreadsheet if you could check to see which one that was, please, I'd appreciate it. So Ms. Harvey, just to clarify, what you're asking would be um, more adept to option two or to option one. So option two with adding a community group or option two where we're sort of taking out stakeholder groups that hold section and simply adding additional speakers. I think what I'm thinking is option three. <laughs> <laughs> which is, uh, I think there's more discussion we need to have about participation. If you're identified as a stakeholder, how is that stake represented in your participation in public comment? But aside from that, I think I'm thinking um, uh, community groups being like we have a stakeholder group, we have a community group slots dedicated, not necessarily identifying this community group or that community group, but saying we will always have a number of spots for community organizations to speak and then the general public comment. And Dr. Hager, you put an idea in the chat. Do you want to speak to that? Yeah, I just kind of building off of what Ms. Harvey was mm -hmm. saying, um, it seems like there are these kind of BCPS affiliated groups that have a BCPS staff liaison that attends the meetings and kind of helps kind of move the the, the progress along um, for these different groups, including our, our union um, groups who meet regularly with, with our BCPS staff liaisons. Um, so potentially, instead of saying stakeholders because I feel like all all parents everyone's a stakeholder you know and so that word is kind of a, a big word to use um, but whether we could somehow designate them as the groups that with an assigned BCPS staff liaison um, similar with Harvey was saying community groups you know with nonprofit status or something like that and then individuals and then those first two groups um, must specify that they're speaking on behalf of a group so similar to how we can cut someone off if they start saying something in flame about an individual or speaking to an individual incident. Um, if someone is supposedly speaking for, for a group but goes off on a tangent about with how they feel personally, you know, that then they could potentially be cut off in, in groups one and two. And then there would, of course, be room for individuals to speak as, as well. Um, again, this is just very, <laughs> very preliminary idea. 
building off of the conversation. And I like that idea too of somewhere adding community groups so that we're not lim so that we're not um, we're not having groups that feel like they need to be necessarily identified as a stakeholder group in order to be heard. Um, I do think somehow though we may want to limit just my opinion limit that. So I'm not sure exactly how that would work, but maybe you know at each meeting we have three slots for community organizations, and then maybe there's a way that we can be sure that the same community organization or, or community group isn't speaking at each meeting. So if you've spoken, if you spoke at one meeting, then the next meeting you're not allowed to speak until the following meeting, just to give someone else a turn. Um, that's even something I've honestly thought about as far as individual speakers. When we pick 10 speakers, as we do now, um, in some situations we're hearing the same people and sometimes there are only 10 and it's not an issue but sometimes we're hearing the same 10 people and there are people who have signed up who i've never heard speak before in front of us um and we do i think we all want to hear everyone speak but we also want to make sure everyone has a chance so that was just another thought i had also as far as limiting um if you've spoken at one meeting and there are more than 10 people signed up and i'm just using this for an example that you can't speak at the, at the next meeting unless there aren't 10 people signed up and there's an opening. I don't know if that's clear what I'm saying, but if you get the idea. <laughs> so um, before I forget, and I do apologize, members of the committee, I neglected to state this. You have received a number of um, emails in the BOE account about um, case and case having um, uh, retaining its stakeholder status so that it would have the right to um, be able to speak at each meeting. Um, you've received a few about TABCO, but last I heard, and Ms. Um, Ms. Gover can correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it was on the order of 80 emails um, from case members. Um, so I understand community groups and groups with the liaison. My um, thought would be that unions or associations would not want to be defined by having a staff liaison. Um, I, my guess uh, would be that they would want to be specifically defined either as uh, the designated bargaining unit <coughs> or group rather, or um, by name, uh, but I don't think um, they would consider themselves to be within the class that you've identified, Dr. Hager, um, with an assigned staff liaison. And I think I think I would be I personally would be agreeable to um, adding that in with Dr. Hager's idea as far as keeping a section for uh, the bargaining units of employees. Um, Ms. Harvey, did you have another comment? Yes, I just wanted to make sure we're considering uh we are are now uh and i'm using the word state stakeholder as because that's the word we use now and understanding that we may change it uh limiting the stakeholder groups the people that can speak at every single meeting to the bargaining units uh, and i'm not sure that that is representative of the spectrum of voices that we want to hear at every every single meeting. I know they come, I know for the most part they speak particularly TABCO and some others, but if we're going to keep this category, I'm not sure that we want to s that 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 is representative and how might we think about um either changing the nature of the category in terms of the uh, right to speak at every meeting or, um, you know, back to this conversation about community groups versus stakeholders uh, in that in that way. I'm just a little concerned that we're saying that the voices we want to hear or that we can hear or, or that are allowed to speak at every meeting are just our bargaining units. I do think just from this discussion, we're making it clear that we do want to make sure, which I think is a good thing, we do want to make sure that voices are heard um, and all voices are heard. And some we don't hear from often because 
you know, they might not sign up as often and they don't get their chance when they do need to sign up because it's an um, an issue with that meeting that is important to them. Um, so I, I think we're having a good having a good discussion, at least, and trying to make sure everyone is included. Um, Dr. Hager, did you have another comment? Um, yeah, I, I um I would think that that first category and, and I, I wrote in the chat after Ms. Sally mentioned that the um, unions wouldn't want to be defined that way. And I totally understand. I was just kind of spitballing uh, how to define that first larger group. But um, but I, you know, if it's a group that has a, a direct affiliation with Baltimore County Schools, I would think it would include the student councils and their advisory committees and the PTAs and kind of a lot of the stakeholder groups that are on the list now. Um, but uh, but I do agree with Ms. Pumphrey limiting, you know, again, if we went with three categories, uh, the affiliated groups, the community groups and the individuals um, limiting number of speakers in each group and potentially putting into play what Ms. Pumphrey suggested about not have, having the same um, groups speak every time. I, I think those are all great ideas um, and I really think this is a great conversation and we're we're making progress, <laughs> even though yes. it's uh, pecking away at this. So. And if I'm not mistaken, Ms. Howe, you may have an answer to this, or it may be on the information you provided. I, I think the Maryland State Board of Education somehow limits their discussion um, as far as the same person speaking at, um, you know, uh, I can't think of the term I'm trying to use, at each meeting, every meeting. I don't recall that the State Board limits, but if you give me a moment, I'll check what we provided previously, ma'am. OK, thank you. I'm going by memory. I think I just remember that for some reason. Um, consecutive meetings, that's what I was looking for. If and that, I, I believe that's only if. Um, if there's not time for them to speak, I may be mixing that up. I'm not sure. Uh, I do like Ms. Hager's or Dr. Hager's uh, uh, categorization of the VCPS affiliated community and then the individual public comment. I think those categories would be um, easily or more easily defined um, when you use that language. So I do think we're we're getting somewhere. Yes, I think we're trying to get away from that stakeholder term. Uh, is the is the main idea here and being sure again that we hear from everyone. OK, so where are we? So you're still discussing. Um, is there consensus as to how you wish the um, <coughs> excuse me staff to proceed? Um, with, I think that uh, Dr. Hager provided a template and is that <laughs> the template, excuse me, based on um, Ms. Harvey's and um, your Madam Chair's input that you'd like us to work with? Yes, I believe so. Dr. Hager or Ms. Harvey, do you have any other? I, I do want to consider, um, I do want to consider the bargaining units. I'm not sure how to word that, but I agree with Ms. what Ms. Harvey said as well. So I'm not sure how to incorporate that or if there may be some different wording we can use to be sure they're included. I can, I think stating what they are um, is, is probably the easiest. So I'm not sure that uh, giving them another name or rose by any other name uh, okay. is necessarily going to um, be clear. And um, I am bringing up the state board's rules. It's page 21 of their um, procedures. All speakers conduct themselves in a non disruptive manner. They have to sign up no earlier than one week prior to and up till three o'clock. Their public comment is limited to 10 speakers. They have a waiting list. Um, comments are limited to three minutes per speaker. No personnel uh, remarks. No signs um, or posters that can be displayed. Uh, the person can be asked to leave and they can provide written statements. So I don't see anything about limiting from one meeting to another, uh, Madam Chair. 
okay, I don't know where I pulled that from. <laughs> I like the idea of limiting, but again, only when I say limiting, I don't mean limiting as far as who we hear, but just to make sure everyone has an opportunity. I'm not sure how to make how to more clarify how to make that clear. So if there aren't spots in consecutive meetings for someone to speak and they've signed up, and maybe there's no way to address that, but that's just the thought that's in my mind. And if Ms. Gover is on, she might be able to talk about the administration of that. I'm not, I, I, I would not want to speak for her, um, but I guess one question that I'm unclear on is, let's say that uh, one of your bargaining groups speaks at the first meeting in February. Does that mean that they aren't able to speak at the second meeting in February? I guess I think maybe and maybe maybe that's that's the issue here because I'm thinking of I was thinking more of individual speakers and not these these groups. OK, more of our 10 individual speakers that sort of don't fit into that category. Mm -hmm. So it, for clarification, are we identifying affiliated groups, BCPS affiliated groups uh, in the new language as our bargaining units and anyone who is direct, any organization that's directly affiliated with BCPS. And does that mean that they are entitled to speak at every meeting? Or are we proposing a structure where we say, there's five affiliated slots, five community slots, and I'm just throwing out numbers here, five individual slots, and you sign up and it's first come, first serve. Because I'm not sure uh, if we say BCPS affiliated, which I think broadens the spectrum and is very clear that you have to have a direct association with BCPS, that could be a, a larger number. <laughs> than what we currently have, I'm not sure. Uh, so are we saying that they are entitled to speak at every meeting or are we changing the title and the parameters under which those uh, groups can speak? Um, this is Erin Hager. I, I like that a lot. Ms. Harvey, just limiting the number in each of the categories and then um, I assume doing a lottery. Um, I, I do like the idea of, of not having the same group speak at every meeting, uh, but potentially at least for this round of revisions, uh, implementing that rule for individuals um, and then using a lottery potentially for the other groups. Um, otherwise, we might be there Till three in the morning if we let everyone <laughs> speak every time so right. okay i think this is tracy if more than 10 people sign up to speak they are always selected randomly the usual people who speak are usually the majority of the folks that make up those 10. there are times where there are 20 plus which brings different speakers i think those are the times that i'm concerned with so i guess it, i mean it i guess it's a matter of how often does that happen probably when a big when a big topic arises where everybody wants to share their input. Um, any thoughts on that? So that's would be just regarding the 10 individual speakers, not the affiliated or community groups. As far as um, speaking at each meeting. I understand that it's a random process. I, I think I think uh, similar to you, Madam Chair, in that when we see the list and we see maybe we have 12 speakers, but the two who weren't selected are people we've not heard from, it does one uh, make you, you know, wonder what voices were missing and we want to encourage people to sign up and make their voices heard. I don't know how to get past that randomizing process it, unless we put a rule in place 
uh, for the individual slots around um, repetitive uh, speaking or consecutive speaking. And I don't know if that makes the process too cumbersome or complicated, um, but I, I am invested in hearing as many voices as we possibly can. And I do understand that sometimes the subject matter is different and, I, and someone may want to speak at the first meeting because we're talking about the budget and they may want to speak at the second meeting because we're talking about some policy. And those are two very different topics, even though it's the same person speaking. So I, I, I'm not sure how we, how we overcome that process. So if I may, uh, members of the committee, just recall um, speaking on policies is a separate category. So individuals are able to sign up to speak on an individual policy without having to represent a particular community group um, association. They don't need to have an affiliation in order to speak on a policy when you have public comment on policies. For example, on my part, something not policy related. <laughs> I think the positive is that we it's not often that we have more than 10, but I do like you mentioned, I do, you know, when there is it's it's. Um, and there are names on there that we haven't heard from when we see the list and realize that they didn't get to speak. It 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 does become. I don't want to say frustrating because we want to hear from everyone, but we were curious as to, to hear what they had to say. This is what I will say, probably likely some people who are speaking in the individual public comment if we shift to add the community organizations they will likely shift to that category which will open up more spaces in the individual comment i think that may happen as well that's a good point OK, so I think where we are at this point is to sort of changing those categories to include. The groups with assigned BCPS staff liaison, community groups with nonprofit status. And individuals. With. So I think you wanted your uh, bargaining groups as well, your bargaining yes. representatives. And if you'd allow me, uh, members of the committee, when staff brings this back um, to find out how many, how many groups have an assigned liaison, um, that may um, that may inform uh, your definition uh, of this category or your description of this category. So I think it's more than less. OK. Or um, another, Dr. Hager mentioned another, another way of naming that may be um, a direct affiliation to BCPS. I think we're just trying to fit in those groups um, that include the area advisory councils. Is that, does that seem like where we're, what we're moving toward? OK, is that it, OK? Yes, that's what we're moving forward to make sure those groups are included. Again, trying to move away from that stakeholder term. OK, Miss Howard, do you have what you need to move forward with that? Yes, members of the committee, I believe so. This will this can this help staff get started. Thank you. And I just want to make sure, um, Ms. Gover, are there any operational concerns that you have as far as implementing? Because it makes no sense to have a policy if we can't implement it. I guess I would have to see it in writing to kind of um, wrap my head around it, I guess to see how it, we could uh, manage that as far as sign up is concerned. And I'm, I, I'm not understanding it yet, so um, I can work with you, Ms. Howie, to 
kind of provide some feedback once I see it in writing. And Ms. Gover, I know we're not trying to drive you crazy, give you more work either. So whatever you, any recommend, once you speak with Ms. Howie, any recommendations you have or your input as far as it be something being more too, too difficult to implement or more complicated to implement than what we expect, please let us know. Thank you, I appreciate that. Any other comments or questions? Okay. So now we are on. The floor is now open to members of the committee to discuss issues of concern. I must emphasize that this is not the time to conduct business as there has not been notice provided as required by Open Meetings Act. Does anyone have anything they'd like to discuss? OK, hearing none, the next meeting of the Policy Review Committee is scheduled for Monday, March 20th at 4.30 p.m. Today is Monday, March 20th, so I don't know when that meeting. <laughs> Let me go back and see. Ms. Howie, do you have this? That's OK. April 24th, ma'am. I apologize. The next meeting is Monday, and I don't know if it's Monday, but it's April 24th at 4.30 p.m. Because there is no further business, I think Dr. Hager, Dr. Hager may have a question. OK, this may be Dr. Hager's last PRC meeting. So Dr. if it is, Hager, I don't want to jinx you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Hager, for your participation and all your input today from what I've heard and. In the past several years, we appreciate it. OK, if there is no further business, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you committee members. Thank you Ms. Pitts and Ms. Wash.